hold on to your seats. This is going to be a wonderfully informative talk, and we are so pleased and honored to have from American University a real life journalist from Northwestern, which is probably the best school in journalism in the country, to speak to us today, Professor Lynn Perry. I'm quite sure I can't live up to that. So. <laughs> but thank you very much. We did have a good session, and we did talk about fake news, which we'll do today. And thank you for coming out on a rainy, rainy day. It's a great <coughs> pleasure to see your pretty campus this morning. I got the water tour with the president. And uh, I'm also pleased to welcome my husband and be part of the greater family that's here in, here in town, and that's been a real treat. So I would like this to be informative, but also a discussion, so feel free to interrupt or ask a question. It's fine. You don't have to wait until the end or anything. I'm going to tell you a little bit about journalism ethics, because I think there's a war on journalists. Um, not completely unusual. Most administrations have a somewhat tense relationship with the journalists that cover <coughs> federal government and state government, but it's become more tense. Journalists have been called enemy of the people and worse. And so I want you to know there is a code of ethics in journalism. We're not licensed like doctors and lawyers, but there is a code of ethics that reputable journalists do follow. So I'll tell you a little bit about what that is, what those tenets are, and then we'll talk a little bit about fake news. Um, if there's still some people in the back, there are a couple of seats up front. You're welcome to come sit down. It's, it's not interrupting. Okay, most of our uh, news organizations in this country follow the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. That's a, a base guideline for them. And if they're Yahoo or BuzzFeed or um, the Tennessean, they may have additional rules of ethics for their own local uh, area or because their editor and publisher have some additional values. But SPJ's core values are to seek truth and report it, to minimize harm, to act independently, and to be accountable and transparent. And what that means is that in any situation that a journalist goes into, he or she is seeking the truth, the best evidence of the truth that he or she can find. So journalism isn't based on rumors. Journalism is fact. Sometimes you hear the term fact-based journalism, which I really never understood. If it's journalism, it is fact. But again, there are different sides to every story, right? And you probably know there are no not only two sides to most stories, but multiple sides. So seek truth and report it the best you can. Minimize harm means you take care of the people you interview, you care about what they have at stake and giving you an interview. You are empathetic, you are sensitive to different situations. Acting independently is what it sounds like. We're not, as journalists, beholden to uh, the people that we're reporting on. We're, we're independent, but our we always keep in mind our readers, what the readers care about, what does the general, <coughs> our general readership or general population want to know, need to know. And then we're also, there's a really renewed and heightened emphasis these days on transparency. So if you ever get a chance to do a long story, a long investigation, a deeper investigation into, say, the opioid crisis uh, in America right now, you'll find that many organizations, large and small, when they report on it, also add additional documentation online for you to see for yourself. These could be hospital records, they could be government records, they could be, in the case of the opioid crisis, records that have now been released showing uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical uh, data from different states that shows how many small pharmacies have had millions of people to do that. So you can see for yourself why the reporting took the turn into a very good response. Then there's fake news. So fake news is news that's not real. It's made up. It's not news that, um, that somebody doesn't like, or it's, it, because again, it wouldn't be news. It, it's wholly made up. So you have to think about how to recognize it and how to stop it. The Pew Center, which is a research think tank in Washington, recently did a nationwide survey that found 
most people don't blame journalists for the problem of fake news and made up information, but they do hold journalists uh, responsible for fixing the problem, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but many people acknowledge that political staffs and leaders are, and activist groups to some extent are more responsible for it, trying to put forth their point of view, or in some cases do so in a way that's not reputable, are more responsible for fake news than journalists. And you can see from this chart that not only are the news media expected to fix the problem, but so is the government and tech companies. And somehow you, in your busy schedule, like you don't already have enough to do, you now have to be a better consumer of news so that you don't want to spread fake news. Did anybody see this? Elizabeth Ward posted a fake ad on Facebook, kind of daring Facebook to take it down. It's not true. She posted something that said Mark Zuckerberg was going to endorse Trump as president. And then she posted it saying, it's not true Facebook, you should take it down. And the head of Facebook said, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Your new rule is you can post whatever politicians say so that people can make up their own minds and see the politicians that are telling the truth. But of course, that's difficult too because you might not know, it's, you may not have the time to sort of sort through all of this, right? The best of my knowledge is still up. Maybe they've taken it down now, but been up, both up for days because um, they just feel that this is the new policy. It may change again, uh, but that it's up to you, the public, to figure out what's real. Has anyone seen the doctored videos of Nancy Pelosi? A few of you have. Let's take a look. I pray for him and I pray for the United States of America. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is a favorite target of Republicans and the alt right. Recent videos circulating online of Pelosi have been manipulated to make her sound sluggish and slurred. This video posted to the Politics Watched Off Facebook page has more than 47,000 shares and 2.4 million views. It shows Pelosi speaking at the Center for American Progress Ideas Conference on May 22nd. But when compared to the Washington Post's verified feed of the same event, it is clear the Facebook video is playing at 75% of the original speed. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. Adjusting a speed like this would make Pelosi's voice sound low and distorted. We want to give this president the opportunity. But her pitch has also been altered to sound more like her natural speech. We want to give this president the opportunity. It's unclear who doctored the original, but versions of the same video were shared by other users on different platforms, some with captions alleging UOC was drunk. And as the falsified clips worked their way around the internet, they also worked their way into the mainstream conversation. She always looked like she's a non-functioning uh, alcoholic, uh -huh. uh, and she slurred her words and rambling over her words. Even President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, shared a fake Pelosi video in a since-deleted tweet. This is not the first time video of the speaker has been manipulated to portray her in a negative light. A YouTube user ripped a video from the conservative channel Next News Network, which criticizes Nancy Pelosi's speech at the American Road and Transportation Voters Association on May 14th. This user only altered Pelosi's speaking, not the anchor. The slowed down version makes Pelosi's speech sound slurred, and the caption alleges she was drunk. I, I congratulate you for this wonderful conference. I want to again commend the clip is a different speed and duration than the original audio from the event. You can hear the video return to normal speed at the end of the clip. I'm confident that it will happen. Well, I said that might be Thank you. Videos posted online can be easily edited or misinterpreted, and many go viral, helping spread lies and misinformation. And according to a report from the Washington Post, experts believe the original video was slowed down to 75% from the original, and that her pitch was also manipulated in order to present her under the influence. Not a real video. It's doctor. The Pelosi videos were crudely edited, but low-tech manipulations like this can be extremely effective at promoting certain narratives among the right audience.
So I show you that uh, to scare you because it is scary what can happen with technology these days. Photoshop, of course, is everyone's favorite way to manipulate photos, but there's a lot of um, video uh, technology now that will allow you to. Amazon announced a round of new products. Almost all of the time, made for Amazon to put Alexa everywhere. <coughs> The Tech Giant revealed a laundry list of hardware. There's a high end Echo Studio speaker, an updated Echo Show Smart Display, Ring Security. Sorry about that. Um, because it is scary, and so it, it is difficult sometimes to tell when something's altered. As you noticed in that one, they changed her pitch as well as the speed, and so it did sound like her. It just sounded like something was wrong. <coughs> So now I'm going to put you to work. I want you to think about whether you've ever encountered a fake news story online and inadvertently shared it with your friend group or you know, pass it along verbally to someone. So if you could just turn to your neighbor and talk for a minute about whether you realize later that you shared something that wasn't real. <laughs>
video or just a Are most of you on Instagram? Yes. How about Facebook? <coughs> and Twitter? <laughs> what? No? I heard some no. Okay. And what else? What else do you use? Snapchat. Snapchat. Oh, Snapchat still? Right. You're not on Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like everybody likes Instagram, right? Do you find anything fake there, or is, is it more likely the other social? There's fake. There is Oh, they're all equal opportunity offenders, so yeah. it's not just it's not just Republican or Yeah, so there's a way you can check. Of course, you may or may not have time, but there are also people who do it for you. There are some fact-checking organizations out there that work really hard at this every day, all the time, and particularly to check political speech. And it's not that individual reporters covering something aren't also checking information as they write about it, but sometimes in the rush of news and coverage, they can't check every single thing that someone said. So that's where our fact-checking departments come in. So I'm now going to show you a second. The accuracy of claims made by politicians, anyone who has power and reach in politics, we start out looking at the precise claim. From there, the process is fairly rigorous, and we assign Pinocchios, depending on how uh, truthful or untruthful that statement is. I think people are well served by having someone reading through reports to find out whether some talking point that you hear a lot on TV from a politician is really accurate or not. My name is Salvador Rizzo. I'm a reporter for the Fact Checker at the Washington Post. My name is Mike Kelly, and I'm the video editor, and I also report for the Fact Checker. I'm Glenn Kessler. I'm editor and chief writer of the Fact Checker. The Fact Checker is intended as a complement not a supplement to the political reporting done at the Washington Post. All too often, reporters covering a particular member of Congress or the President have to write about the news. And they don't really have the opportunity or the time to step back and say, well, here's what the President said. Is this necessarily correct? So we come in with a fact checker and explain the facts behind the statement of that public. We use the quotes by politicians as a way to dig deep, deep into difficult, complex issues. The process is fairly rigorous and essentially also just a journalistic process. We start out looking at the precise claim. We try never to infer. Sometimes it starts with just a simple Google search. You put in the number of the factoid. And you can quickly find, oh, they got it out of this think tank report. And then you can kind of dig in and see whether or not that report was done well or, or was just a partisan did the job. And then eventually, of course, we go to the politician's office. A lot of people take us up on the offer and spend considerable time and effort uh, trying to address our questions with a lot of you know, primary source documents and data. Because the evidence rests with them. And we take their evidence and then we test it. And a lot of people just totally don't care and they blow us off. We're always trying to get the most authoritative information or data that goes to the heart of the question we're trying to ask. You know, for any given fact check, we'll be conducting interviews with experts or government officials, we'll be looking at official statistics, we'll be looking at 
historical records, official uh, agencies, such as the Congressional Budget Office, Treasury Department, the Commerce Department, the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. For one fact check, I talked to a lawyer in Miami who represents drug courts <coughs> because, you know, just that's, that's where the fact check took me and that's what I did. You're just trying to find the person who really knows the topic really well and intimately and can really uh, set your reader straight as to who's telling the truth or who's fudging the truth a little bit. The Washington Post Fact Checker is a verified member of the International Fact Checkers Network. We are accessed on an annual basis to see whether or not it meets five broad principles that were set by the IFCN. And those are things such as a commitment to transparency, a commitment to nonpartisanship, a commitment to admit your mistakes. And it's important because uh, you have assurance that we are upholding those standards, and also it has allowed the fact-checking movement to grow by leaps and bounds, everyone is moving in the same direction, the same concept of what fact-checking is. Our job is really both to translate sometimes what the columnists are doing, but also to do our original reporting that allows video to really shine. For example, sometimes you'll see a politician or public figure tweet out a misleading video. We've gone and sort of figured out where that comes from and what you're actually looking at as opposed to what a politician might be saying. More and more we have visual stuff all over our culture and I think having video as part of the fact checker allows us to be engaged with that part of politics as well. Because they recognize that some people did something. So much is communicated through video these days. Our role is really important in that it provides a different platform and a different space um, for the same great reporting that the fact checker has always been known for. The ideal fact check is usually something that involves a number. That's something that can be tested, scrutinized. Often we're not quite sure what we're going to be fact checking when we walk into the office that morning. Most of the time we're writing off the news. Often that's where you'll find you know, the material to fact check that will really grab people's attention and will really serve a purpose in the moment of the debate. We have to work fast, we have to work quickly, but people have learned that when we come call in, then they quickly answer our questions. Well, Pinocchio, you know, was a little boy uh, whose nose would grow uh, when he told a fib. You haven't been telling the truth. There's sort of a ridiculous aspect to a cartoon character in the middle of these weighty political debates. A poor Pinocchio score on truthfulness. A four Pinocchios from the Washington Post. We gave him no fewer than eight Pinocchios. The newspaper's fact checking team says that Trump has now told more than 10,000 lies or misleading claims. This is a remarkable number. That's a ridiculous number. Like, if Trump was Pinocchio, he could probably tell you what it smells like in China. That's how far that is. Where are the fact checkers? Where are the fact checkers? Pinocchios. I mean, the Pinocchio is just a, it's just a shorthand. Four is for a whopper. Three is for something that's basically mostly false. Two is halfway there. There are issues that could be something taken out of context, not the whole story. Uh, one bit of is not bad. That means it's probably mostly true. We also have something called the Geppetto check mark. Uh, Geppetto, of course, was the man who crafted uh, Pinocchio. But we were, are rather uh, careful in how we award it. We tend to focus on statements that are unexpectedly true. You know, we try not to be too scary about what we do, but we are watching you. You know, we literally that's all we do. We, we look at every single thing the president says. You know, we, we spend hours going through transcripts and tweets and video. See, if it's off well, by one hundredth of a percent, it's like I end up getting Pinocchios. Right? All the people running for president, you know, they're starting to get to know us. <laughs> Freshman members of Congress, they're starting to get to know us. You know, we are watching you. It's part of our job. Don't take it too seriously. <laughs> one thing about Fact Checker, lots of people don't know, is that. So many of our ideas come from reader submissions. So if you see something, or you're in a town hall, or you're reasoning your local newspaper that just sounds fishy to you, please send it our way. We would love to check it out. So the question is, what can you do? There are a few things that the Society of Professional Journalists recommends you do. You can take a closer look at the story and see if you recognize the website. See if it really makes sense to you. 
If it's not a .com or a .edu or a .org or a .net, it might be suspicious. There are some other ones out there, but those are the most common. Uh, look behind the headlines. A lot of fake news uses all caps and exclamation points. Um, check other sources. Sometimes if you're interested in something and you wonder if it's real, if you do a basic Google search for it, you should see four or five news organizations reports on that thing or that data point or that action pop up, not just not just one. And then you can look also at when it was published. Sometimes fake news is published two years ago, three years ago. It's something that maybe was true at one time, or part of it was true at one time, and someone has resurrected it and doctored somebody to make it look like that thing is true now. You can think about your own biases. Are you reading sort of the same things all the time? Do you owe it to yourself to sometimes look outside of your normal reading habits and see what else is being reported? And then, you guys all know The Onion? It's a satirical website, but a lot of people don't know The Onion. Sometimes The Onion stories have been circulated. The headlines are sort of, sort of so outlandish or funny that those get circulated and people don't know what The Onion is and they, they think it's real. But the question is, do you have the time to do all this? And that's that's the biggest problem, right? You're not, this isn't your job, you don't have lives and jobs and school. So it is really hard. Um, but my recommendation is you'll, you'll actually grow from, from even doing this once in a while because you'll begin to yourself get better educated about what kinds of uh, news is out there, different kinds of news, different ways of storytelling, the way the news is told by CNN may seem to you obviously liberal and Fox obviously conservative, but there are lots of nuances in there, and there are lots of organizations that find themselves in being nonpartisan and non-political, and so they they are trying to go that middle road, that you know that straight arrow that tells you there are multiple sides to this and to present your own stories. So I think I think you it, it's kind of a hard thing to get in the habit of. Obviously, you can't do it every time someone sends you something. It's kind of outrageous. But it's a good, it's a good thing to try. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. And Randall, um, do you want to come up, or do you want to have some questions too? Mm -hmm. So I'm out. We're going to read some too. Okay. This is the Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights is the first ten. Minutes. And first, the first amendment. I want you to hear this before you answer the question. Amendment number one. Congress shall make no law. Respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. You hear now in the last few years about the press as the enemy. But you see, that was the number one of all the amendments that we now know as first to Bill Watts. So I want us to think about that and set our state. And let's do something Dr. Parker's question. Uh, some of the information here comes from the view of the